myself because uh, I don't know everybody here in this room and I've been on sabbatical in Chile uh, for a year. So uh, I am, uh, my name is Shandor Tota, I'm an associate professor uh, of natural resource informatics here at the University of Washington School of um, Environmental and Forest Sciences. And most of my work is about uh, mathematical modeling, especially optimization um, in the area of in, uh, environmental and, and, and forest sciences, of course. And um, the, the area that is, is, is most exciting for, both for me and for Andres is when we try to optimize management under conflicting objectives. And so some of his talk is going to be about that. But um, uh, Andres is a professor of industrial engineering at uh, University of Chile. And uh, he has many awards, uh, one of which is um, the one that I, I remember the uh, I don't remember the name of the award, but I remember that, that it comes in a monthly stipend of over a thousand dollars or something. The National Prize in Science. Yeah, so I, that's, that's the kind of award I would like well, to get. I, I plan to live a long life. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also a member of the, the U.S. National Academy of uh, Engineers and also a member of both the Chilean National Academy of uh, Science and Engineering and also the winner of the Edelman's, Franz Edelman Prize in 1998, which is the biggest award of, of our organization, um, the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, INFORMS. And uh, what else should I, should I say about you? The main thing is I'm the board of my football club in Chile. Oh, uh -huh. one of the great teams. <laughs> <laughs> we won the South America Cup in 2011. Unfortunately, now we're in last place, but we relegated to second division. <laughs> that happens, I have to leave Chile, maybe come here. They will go, the fans are going to kill me. Anyway, so with that, uh, uh, please um, enjoy. Thank you, Professor Sir, for the invitation. Thank you for coming. It's not the first time. Uh, I was Rachel's uh, thesis advisor, I mean, the committee. And it's a great school, it's a lovely place. Actually, I have a nephew who was a professor here for a while with the biotechnology. Uh, I'll tell a little bit about myself. I'm an industrial engineer. I got my internship in Berkeley. And I was looking for a job on my wife in Sherpa, in statistics. And it was a huge recession. The only thing I could get was in the US Forest Service, first part time, then full time. It was a couple of years. And then I went back to Chile and we kept working long distance. And that's like, by chance, I ended up working, my core work is operations research in forestry. Yeah, but I could have got any other job, but I wasn't there. The work I'm going to present has to do with climate change, a lot of stochastic models. And there's a big group of people I've worked with, uh, Antonio Alonso and Andrea Scudero from Madrid, Madrid. they're stochastic people. Eduardo Alvarez is a young researcher in Chile, uh, Susana Pareto in Lisbon, uh, Jordi Garcia is they have a very good institute for science and of course technology in Catalonia. They, they do very good work. Winnie Guillard Gordon, she's an operations research person. Dave Martel is probably the top guy in forest fires uh, around. It's all Paris. As a student of mine is doing her PhD in Turkey. John for Watson's idea about the works of David Google. They're mostly math or art or computer people. And Papa Bogal is a student of Chile who works with us. That comes at home. And next time I give a talk, your name will also hopefully be there. And Martin. If it's good stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you talk about OR, how many people have a good knowledge of OR here? Okay, OR is basically mathematical models for management. There are millions of papers, and several areas where it's been successful. Probably FedEx, for example, could not run without operations research, all the logistics, transportation. Forestry, it's one of the areas where OR has been very, very successful. Big companies and U.S. Forest Service people use OR models 
to the last 40 years or so. Actually, my first job in the US Forest Service was my boss was the guy who created the first media program used in forestry. So we used overall by the whole uh, by whole community of foresters, there was even a Congress law that compelled the US Forest Service to use this system. And the reason it happened was was interesting. Uh, the Forest Service, I guess you all know, owns a lot of land. And companies sort of bid to get to, to harvest the land. There was a huge pressure from companies for the Forest Service to bid more and more land, so bid more land for harvesting. So Congress passed a law that you had to have long range plans so that we had to have non declining yield. So if the companies put pressure, the Forest Service would say, look, if, if I give you too much land now, I won't have 30 years from now. And they did planning using simulation. It turned out that the feasible region of solutions with the non-declining yield constraint was really small. And they couldn't find it using simulation. Basically, in simulation, you have to process a solution. And the simulation lets you know how it would come out. So that's why in the 60s, uh, Daniel Neyman, he created the first media program saying, the only way you can get feasible solutions and better solutions is by using optimization. That's how it was introduced, first in the US Forest Service and then the rest of the world. And that's been very successful. These are easy and uh, they're used all over. Uh, for me, term planning of models, it's basically, it's within the rotation. It's, it's, not, it's not long range. It's what are you going to harvest the next five years, 10 years? It has to do with harvesting, it has to do with road building, and in the last 20 years or so, it has to do with the environment. For example, maybe you've seen for us here, there is a very basic rule. You cannot harvest large patches of land, mostly 58 hectares. It's like a chessboard. If you harvest the black squares, you have to wait 10, 20 years to you harvest the new one. These are mixed models, and they've been used very successfully since the 80s or 90s. There's big, a lot of challenges, theoretical challenges, many papers written on theory about it, how, how to best derive the best algorithms. And then there are operational models. We worked on that in the 90s. This, with these systems, we won the Edmund Prize in 98. One was short-term short harvesting, which means you have, let's say, the next 45 years contracts. You have to submit length, how much volume, it's pine plantations, length and diameter and quality, so many meters. And then you have sort of, these are, these are my contracts, here are my forests, how do you match them? And then we're doing it basically using Excel, something like that. And they were wasting about 10-15% of the timber. Since it didn't match when they harvested, well, in the end they had to send high quality saw timber to the pulp mill, losing about $50, $50 per cubic meter. Using these LP models with power generation, they, could, they went down to 2%. Then there was the track scheduling. I mean, it's typical operations where you send you have maybe 20 places in the forest you're working, you have 10 destinations, mills, ports for export. Okay, how do you schedule this? And they used to do it with blackboards. And we created a simulation model, which was very successful. Uh, they saved about 15% of the cost uh, using this. And the third was machine location. You're going to harvest, let's say, this room. Some are hills, some are flat. You use tractors or towers, cable logging. Where do you put your machinery? How do you build the roads? These things were very successful. It's been used in many other places. So the deterministic planning for these things has been really successful for a while. Now, reality is not the reason, unfortunately. And yet, this is the tree growth. Uh, I think the, the first, uh, the first uh, statistical models to project tree growth were in the 60s. They were all deterministic. But there is, I mean, there are variations in that. We have a program in that. Then you have markets. What's going to be the price of power in the next couple of years? There's no Big one, forest fires. 
uh, we're working a lot on forest fires. I'll do one slide on that, uh, because it's not part of the talk, but to, to just to show you people what we're doing. And the big thing is climate change. So it affects all of this, especially now forest fires. I don't know if it's been experienced, I guess, also here, but in Chile, the, the level of forest fires has increased enormously. When we worked with the companies 10, 15 years ago, we talked about forest fires, zero interest. Now the budget just to fight the fires is $50 million a year. There are stands that have never been harvested because they, the fire burns them before they get to the age of harvest. It's a huge problem. And I understand it's all over the world. So I'm going to talk about this, what happens with climate change. The other thing is multiple objectives. If you are in a firm, okay, maximize net revenue might be the objective, but really there are more. Just uh, There's a big discussion, which I won't go into this, but we've had it. What should the discount be? If, where, when I was working with the US Forest Service, uh, the rotation time was 80 years. Now, you put 5% discount rate, it's not even worth planting. So what should we do? 1%, 2%, add additional conditions, consider that it, not everything is just net present value. The southern part, nobody would plant or take care of the forest. Then there are the huge thing of environmentals, spatial distribution of harvest and adjacency, all growth protection for species, erosion, land erosion, water quality, is harvest administration is sweet enough. There are all these things that should be considered. And you cannot put on all of them just the easy way money to, to make everything in one objective. So using multiple attributes uh, should be there. I'll talk to that about later, but I have to confess right away, nobody's really using it. Uh, in, in reality, nobody, I, I don't know of any company or institute that's making decisions using rigorous what 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 they have to be. Uh, what they have to be. And also social recreation, you have to allow, it's in many places, it's a central hub for jobs. So you need to, to, to keep a, a constant uh, production <coughs> for the jobs. So I'm going to talk now about uncertainty. Uh, this is why we have thought we could have first determine where the level of uncertainty. This are certainly everywhere. I would going to consider it. For example, when we did this track scheduling system, this obvious uncertainty, a track going from here to here, takes on the average 40 minutes, plus minus something, there is uncertainty. It may rain, it may be other problems. Is it worth considering? No. To go for purposes of management, the, the run cannot take more than a couple minutes. You go to a stochastic model, it's a mess. Uh, and it's so important. So we said there is, there is uncertainty, but it's not significant, it's not important. Okay, add five minutes to the average time to make sure things more or less run, run smoothly. Then, this is a major problem, how to present uncertainty. Uh, for example, what model are you going to use? Is it stochastic, two stage and stage model? Is it scenarios? We use scenarios, but we can discuss a lot of what is. And then, determine the model for uncertainty. That means you find you have some stochastic model to solve here, then solve it, which is very difficult. And I'm going to go through all the steps, interpret the solution, and in the end, I'm going to add something with risk aversion. Most models typically just consider decision makers who are neutral in terms of a risk, but in reality, most of us are risk averse. Okay, where does the certainty lie? One example, suppose it would, would timber prices, all prices, so it's an nice word on copper prices. In this case, we're not going to see the other alternatives like tree growth or fires. We represent uh, uncertainty through scenarios. A scenario means, suppose you have 10 periods, one year each, is the price for each of the 10 years. That's a scenario. It's, it's like a line over time. Uh, 
you, you can have as many scenarios as, as you want. Now, the problem is if you have, uh, you want to be really fine, prices are really continuous. Five dollars thirty so, thirty-two se uh, cents is different from thirty-five dollars thirty-three cents. Nobody works with continuous. You have to discretize it. Now, if you use it to find discretization, you end up with a huge problem. It's, if, if it's too rough, you will not really represent the reality. So there is one major issue: is what's the underlying uncertainty? Do you really know it or not? In the months, we assume there is some underlying uncertainty which you can capture, which is already a big thing. Now, once you have this basic, is okay. I cannot really represent it faithfully with a million scenarios. I can only manage when I look back, okay, I have to solve it eventually. Let's say most, most a thousand scenarios. How do I choose those scenarios so that they represent well the already uh, huge it's original number of scenarios. Now, in the first papers we wrote, we just did it manually. We asked, I mean, we looked at statistics, we talked to experts, and okay, we assumed the price of the next few years will be such and such. And as the first approximation was okay, but basically what we should work and what we do now is a more rigorous, basically, it's a stochastic process reverting to a mean, which is used a lot in commodities. It's a random, it moves randomly, reverting to a mean, and this itself is just for, could be one talk. It's sort of this complex mathematics, differential equations, and how to use fast data to build a model scenario tree. And when you're going to, let's say, this is the arc, you're going to discretize, what you do is you, you do a finer discretization in the area where you're worried more about. Let's say low prices, that would kill me. So I do more discretization in this area than in this one which doesn't work. And especially, you need to take care of them what they call the black swans, which is events of variable probability, but if they do happen, they, they cause a lot of damage. If you remember the price of 2008, all the systems, financial systems, were geared up to 99% reliability. What they didn't consider if the 1% happened it was going to be catastrophic. That's a black swan we missed, among many other things. So here's an example with one, two, three periods. We say the price, this is the price today, put the second go up, go up a little bit, go down, down, then you go to the second period, even if you're here, or you can move. And that's where you create a number of scenarios. Here's a number of scenarios here. Each path from here to here is a scenario. Now, given the equations you have, the differential equations, you run many simulations, and you can have them here the probability of each scenario. Now, building a scenario, and Martin is working on this, worked on that, is already a tremendous challenge. In some places, where we said, if, if we have a believable scenario tree, we're done. I mean, the rest is just pure, some mathematics and predictions. This is a huge challenge. We have a believable tree scenario. Here's an example of price. Today the price is up 357, it might go between 228 and 471, you just find the probabilities. In the second period, if you are here, you might move to any of those points. So basically, given that we're at the given point here, it might move, you have to know in which direction it will move, and it's very unlikely that you will go from, let's say, a very low price next year to a huge price. That's something enormous happens. So in that way, you have to be very careful how you build the scenarios. You assign how many, how many of these branches you want to each period. We've worked a lot on that to find this equilibrium between number of scenarios and represent reasonably well the reality. 
I'll go back on this I'll work on this example. It's very simple. Most of you are familiar with forest harvesting. Yes? Maybe 30% of us. Is that a good estimate? Yeah. Okay. It's basically... Okay, I'll, I'll show the... Okay, show this. You have two forests. These are stacks you want to harvest. And you'll get money to harvest them. However, you need to access them to harvest them. And this, this, the full lines are roads that already exist. This ones are roads you might have to build. So the problem is, suppose you have three years, in every year I'm going to harvest some part of it, but in order to get there, I have to build the roads. And how do I manage this? What do I do every year? So every year I satisfy the demand and build the roads, harvest in such a way that net present value is maximized. That's the basic problem. And this is, I mean, we did this in the 90s, it's well established. It's, 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 by now it's a mature problem. So, I will go to the next slide. But basically, you have to decide which hectares are you going to harvest, how much sugar are you going to get of it, how you going to transport it, and which roads are you going to build. Here's a real example. This is a forest in the 90s. Yeah. There were the 17 forests. This was one of the largest. Here you see the existing roads in blue, the potential roads in red. And it's 24, 25 stats. Now this is a curious thing. We sold it for the, co the company, which uses for several years. We wrote a, uh, a paper for Bruce's research, which is a major journal for us. And in order to be able to solve it, if we run it as it was, it's using CPLEX 3.0, something like that, it took 10 hours and we had a gap which means the difference between the solution we had so far, the best we had so far, and the bound of about 20%, completely unacceptable. So we used all the tools we had, Lagrange generalization, strengthening of the formulation, many tools, and we got it something 1% gap in one hour. And we're very happy to publish the paper. About four years later, we wanted to go back to the problem, and we ran it using CPLEX, everyone knows CPLEX. That's, it's a basic software to solve linear programming and mixed integer programming. It's one of the two major softwares. So four or five years later, we used a, a better version, maybe it was CPLEX 7, and the whole thing ran to optimality in a couple minutes. It's going that fast. So if we, we had had no paper, if we had waited a few years, <laughs> it just just to see, uh, I probably know, the power of this computer advances the software, Simplex made a test. In 15 years, they, they say, okay, let's take the same problem, run it on the software and machine this year versus 15 years ago. And the power gain, I think it was one million. So every 15 years, the power for so powers of solving problems multiplies by one million. In 30 years, it's a billion, billion, billion. So problems were completely impossible to solve. They suddenly become easy. And that's not so dramatic here. It's more dramatic in, in mining, which we've worked on. Until about 15 years ago, uh, if you wanted to plan out to extract mineral from a mine, there were mathematical packages that were sort of very approximate. Uh, since then, we've been working using mixed integer programming, which gives you much better solutions. It was, it's, it's, it's fantastic how fast, fast it goes. Now, in this case, we considered a certain difficulty market prices in people. So we built this deterministic model for each scenario. And what changes there are the parameters in tree growth and prices. And the solution must be feasible for all scenarios. For example, if there is a minimum demand for year three, it has to be satisfied under all scenarios. And we want to maximize the expected revenues. 
So basically, what we change here is a deterministic problem into a problem where W is a scenario, which has a probability W, maximize the expected value so that the problem is feasible under all scenarios. Now, this is a very basic theorem stochastic problem, which basically says the following. We have here all these scenarios ending in 10, 11, 12, 13, 17. This is one scenario, this is another scenario. If at this node the scenarios are exactly the same, which means 10, 11, 12 are the same, the solutions for each of those scenarios must be equal up to this point because they share the same information, which is, makes a lot of sense, but mathematically, Wetzel and Rockefeller worked a lot, I and mean, it's a very difficult theory to prove. And you have to add this to those constraints. So basically, now what we have to solve is a problem like this, the scenario, plus all the elements that are difficult constraints that are many. That's the problem we have to solve, and that's what Martin has been working with, PhD theory. Now you have this problem, if you have, let's say, 10 scenarios, you solve it and it runs okay. Once you start increasing the number of scenarios, it gets more and more difficult. At some point, it blows up. So there are several ways of handling. What is this class analysis? You have many scenarios which are sort of similar, plus them into one. That's one possibility. The other is use the composition, okay. which means it's typically probably if you, if you use mathematical programming, there are many ways of decomposing problems into simpler forms. So you solve smaller problems, but you have to iterate many times how you solve them. What we're using here is called pH progressive hedging. Uh, it's, it, the basic idea is you have, let's say, 100 scenarios. You relax this sort of Anybody? Lagrangian relaxation, which means you have a set of complicated constraints, you know, take them away, put them in the objective function. So you get then simple problems to solve. This is the same idea. If you take this away, you can solve for each set of scenarios separately. So you have 100 scenarios, you have 100 problems to solve, but once you solve them, what will happen is that you will not satisfy you will not satisfy the anticipativity constraints. So what you do is penalize the deviations. And the more I'm not going to go to too many details, let's say in one x star bar is the average of a, of a of a variable for which everybody should be the same. So the more you differ from this, the worse you are. And you're going to penalize in such a way that that variable in the next iteration goes closer to the average. And you iterate until you hope that you get that there is very little difference that all quantitative constraints will be satisfied. There are a lot of tricks I want to go to this. Basically, uh, what you want to do here is, if it's a continuous problem, there is a convergence point. The problem, if you do this pH, it will converge, but who knows when. But most of our problems are 0, 1. So we do tricks. Basically, what you, do, you have a very large problem at the beginning, impossible to solve. So the basic trick is, you do an iteration, and some variables happen to satisfy an anticipativity constraint, you fix it. Now this is the heuristic, there's no reason, maybe at the optimal solution, those variables instead of being at one, might be at zero. But you fix it. In every iteration you fix, let's say, 20% of the variables. In the end, you end up with the three variables that are maybe 15% of all of them, and that one you can solve using a commercial code. And that's the way we, we solve it maybe six, eight iterations of the pH, and then go to the basic MRP with other things that have to, uh, have to work on.
for example, uh, this is the objective, which has one term, which is the real objective. This is the parallelization. And here, the objective term, so that the, from one direction to the next, the value doesn't go too far. It's like a smoothing. But you don't really need here a quadratic term to linearize it. Okay, maybe four, four, uh, four steps, four linear linear points. Uh, have you heard about hot starts? When, when you're solving many times the same problem, where you change just a little bit from one to the next, what you do is use the solution of the nth problem as a starting point to the nth plus one. Usually they get you much faster. And there are sort of many tricks you do to be able to, to solve this problem. Now, just to give you an idea of the, of, of, of the dimension of the problem, we had 17 problems. We generate up to thousand scenarios. One scenario is the deterministic original problem we solved in the 90s, which is pretty really small, 798 binary variables. When you go to a thousand scenarios, you go up to over 180,000. Now, the computer power is much faster now, so that helps, but still, it's, it's very large. So, and here's where, where, where sort of the art comes in. How are you going to create the scenarios? You have some idea of the, what happens with the prices historically. You have some idea of, of the statistical methods to uh, uh, forecast growth. And you discretize it. How many scenarios? What we do is usually start with not too many, maybe 50. Then, add 50 more in a very well chosen way so it's sort of filling the gaps. Add 50 more, add 100 more, and at some point you realize that by adding 100 scenarios more, the solution doesn't really change. At that point you might say, okay, at least apparently it doesn't it make, it's not worth to have more scenarios. With what I have, I can represent world and circle. In our case, it turned out that about with 500 scenarios we had already managed pretty well, we ended up with a thousand scenarios. Now, it was very difficult to solve, so we went to this decomposition method. And what we did here was compare the original formulation with the pH formulation in a serial way, and then use parallel programming, which is very powerful. And you can see it makes sense. Parallel Parallel computation means you have a thousand problems, you can send them to different cores, they solve it and come back to you, the master problem, you, you change something, you send them back. It's very, it's, it, it fits very well. And we use Ayomo and PSD to implement this, you see this as a solver. And here you can see the result. This is extended simulation. You can see at about 350 scenarios, it's starting to die. It's going up, 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 up. This is the computer time. In minutes. Already here, over 3,000 minutes. If you want to go to 1,000 scenarios, it won't even go there. Whereas the serial, you can see here, you can do 1,000 scenarios in 2,000 minutes, which is still a fair amount of time, but it's good. So then we went to parallel programming. And basically, I'm not a parallel programmer, but it's, it's complicated. It's a, it's a whole art. Uh, another story from yesterday. About 30 years ago, 25 years ago, parallel computing started to explode. And some colleagues of mine thought it was a very good research area. And years later, they would tell me a huge mistake. Parallel programming, you have to work, it depends what you do on the system you have, the computers you have. There's no theory. There's nothing I can develop in my computers that I'm going to publish and everyone's going to use it. So I wasted my life there. I mean, the three years were wasted, five years, 
because I couldn't get really research credit over there. I could do excellent with my computers, but it was nothing that was, could be generalized. And here, what, what kills you is the overhead. Uh, you have like, I'm the root computer. I send the programs to all the computer, so let's say it's the course. They solve the problem, come back to me, and I have to do, so change the prices, do a price or whatever, and send them back. Now, it's this coming and going, if you're not careful, it's going to kill you. And so you have to work very, very carefully at it. And there are choices you have to make. Are you going to wait until all the problems have been solved, until you update everything? Or are you going to dynamically? Once I have five problems solved, I send them back with whatever I have and keep going. What happens if the number of sub-problems are much larger than the number of cores? There's a lot to be worked on. So this is somewhere that it's not really research, but it has to be done very well. The, so what we did here, Cristobal worked a lot of that. You could see that using one communication course, we got a reduction of 86% of the computer time. So instead of 2,000 minutes, it was 276 minutes. So we could solve the problem to 76 days, that's acceptable. Uh, so it's a lot of work until building the scenarios, we are, this is the problem, uh, choosing the stochastic model, solving it, doing the computer part, uh, it, it's a lot of work. But uh, we can solve it. At the end, we can solve this and publish it. And, well, the f I got this question at some point. Uh, is it worth doing all this? It's a lot of work. You have to find out what the uncertainty is. Build a stochastic model. Solve it. A lot of computer work. And in some cases we find out it's not even worth it. And the question is, is it? And all the papers we published the, the last thing we do is, is it worth doing, was it worth doing this? Or if you had just used the expected values, you have done with it done very well. So in this case, the way we do it is the following. There are two planners. One is the deterministic planner, just where it works with expected values, and there are the stochastic planner, who knows this and builds the, the, the scenario tree, the stochastic model, etc. And then what we do is, Take this solution and put it into the stochastic scenarios, in each scenario, and see how it behaves. Because we assume that the scenarios we have represent the reality of what might happen. And we're looking for robust solutions. The idea of stochastic modeling is no matter what happens, I'm not going to be to do very badly. That's the basic, that's why you put the black swans and you take them into account. So we took one example. This is the case where the risk is very bad. And what well, here is the solution of the deterministic problem, the stochastic. And we needed uh, a certain amount in this case, but it wasn't feasible in many other cases. And, and the logic behind this is the following. Uh, if you take a deterministic solution, you're going to have, let's say, a volume production of 100 every year. So you harvest those experiments. But you get the bad scenarios. In the last five periods, you only get 60 production. You're not going to be able to satisfy the contracts if you use the deterministic the expected values. Whereas the stochastic model takes them into account. So basically, the expected value will be a bit less because it's like insurance. You take your pay in insurance, but you protect yourself against the bad scenarios. That's it. And this is so in this case, you might say, well, it might be worth to do a stochastic model. In other cases, you would say, well, but look, even if it is someone who doesn't really care about stochastic models, every year I have the option of planning again. Would I do it now for 10 years? I, I probably I can change it every year. And in that case, it, it gets much better, this deterministic. And we've had sort of both cases. In some cases, the difference wasn't really big. In other cases, it was still. What you screwed up the first year, you could never recover from that. 
in a way that is mind, for example. You, you show the wrong direction in which to, to, to expand the mind, you would never recover from that. So, uh, and this is a major point that you have to decide, is it worth or not going to stochastic models? It's basic. I mean, if you are in research, you always want to do it. Yeah, sure. That's, that's, but if you are talking to managers, you have to be very careful about it. And in forestry, I don't know of any case where uh, forest managers who use a lot of OR have used explicitly, explicit stochastic models. I, I, I haven't seen that. So it's basically function things. <laughs> Climate change, it's a big issue. I had discussions. That, I, uh, I was sharing an institute and they had a meeting in our faculty about climate change. There's a huge conference called 25 so to be held in Santiago in the next, next month, also on climate change, maybe you know about it. And what should we do about climate change? With, with climate change? It's obviously a big problem. Most of the people understand that. What we're thinking is the following. Look, climate change is coming anyway. You can do it better or worse, depending on how we handle it. But it's coming. What measures should we take given that it's coming? Forest fires is an example. Uh, how are we going to handle the idea, of, I'm not going to go into details, of forest management and the equipment you need to for, fight for fires given <coughs> that climate change is coming, it's going to get much worse. And we're working on that. Um, okay. uh, given the scenarios, what should we do? What should we do? Part of it in forestry for carbon sequestration, we can help also uh, limit the change of climate. But basically what we're concerned here is it's happening. How are we to protect population from forest fires? So so this is uh, what we're doing. Yeah. See, these are obvious things, renewable energy, electric cars. These are obviously things that are going to have climate change. So, in forestry, what's going to happen? Tree growth is going to change. It's going to be wetter, warmer. Carbon sequestration is going to change, but also forests have an important part to play in climate change. So, when I'm going to talk in seven minutes about uh, multiple attributes, a carbon sequestration is an important outlook of forests when you're doing your harvesting. It, it will affect environmental protection and basically this forest fires. We've talked about it already, it's, it's a huge change we've seen in the past few years. Now, we work with people in Portugal. And, and this is, I think it's interesting the way we do it. There was one group of people in Portugal who, who had scenarios for climate change. They, they, they were. There's another group of foresters who took uh, those scenarios and transformed those scenarios on tree growth scenarios. And here are the things they took. Temperature, rain, radiation, number of days of rain, frost, etc. These are the, the, what, what drives the people. Now, what's interesting about climate change, an exception of most other predictions, usually the history is a good predictor of the future. In climate change, it's not, because climate is going to change. So whatever happened, let's say, forest fires 10 years ago, does not really give you just the number of fires. It's not a good predictor of the next fi fi the fires in the 10 next years. It has to be process managed. If these conditions happen, you're likely to get a fire. So basically, what, what you do is, I'll, I'll make it simple, if the temperature and the wind go up and measure, fires are going to happen no more often. Now, I predict that in the future it's going to be high temperature and more wind. And from there I take the forest fires, not from the forest fires I've seen in story. So that's a very nice work we did. In, 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 in taking the tree growth and, and other uh, technical aspects, not from the historical view, but going to the process, what explains it, and then those basic parameters, <coughs> having the scenarios of rain, 
sunshine, etc. So, and that's where we came in, after the, the second book, of, as it were. And basically, again, we took the, the, the scenarios, the pre-flow scenarios, we built the model, similar to the ones we discussed. And these are from different demands of paper. I'll just show you a small example here for scenarios 17 and 18. The deterministic, oh, I'm sorry, scenarios 14 to 16, the deterministic model could find physical solutions. It's a way of finding out what, what the impact is of not considering the weather scenarios. But it's complicated. You need one team to give you good weather scenarios, another team who's capable of transforming the weather scenarios into fire scenarios, triple scenarios, or whatever. It's very complex. Now I'm working with, with, with Sandor, where we have thesis in Chile. Uh, they have an interactive, I get it wrong. They have, I mean, ma management bureau has weather scenarios, four or five weather scenarios. Some of those weather scenarios lead to more, much more severe storms than we used to have. Now these severe storms will block access to parts of the forest unless you build much better roads. So what we're building, this a thesis, is a stochastic model which considers all these scenarios and makes decisions considering that in some scenarios you will not be able to access some areas in some periods unless you pay a lot more for road building. Can you get more right? Yeah. And there were, I mean, it's a thesis being done and we're getting a lot of support and getting data from people here because it's a real problem. How should we manage the forest in, in Washington, given that we're expecting in some scenarios much heavier storms than we're used to, which will block routes? I think it's important to emphasize that here, <coughs> climate change doesn't, it's, it's not the impact on the growth of the trees, but the impact on whether the timber is accessible or not. If there's a big storm that destroys the road links, the timber that is serviced by that road length is no longer going to be accessible. So the climate un uncertainty has an effect on access rather than yield. So it's, it, from a modeling perspective, it, it, this sort of difference uh, poses uh, a big challenge, methodical challenge. Norway, we've talked to people in Norway, they have a similar problem, storms with, with, with access. This is just a paper. <laughs> so we took another forest scenario of certain growth and timber prices with criteria that was the value, carbon sequestration, and soil erosion. And basically what we do, I think there are many techniques, we, we form the Pareto uh, surface of your PS. Can I, sorry for interrupting, sure. before we switch to multi-objective optimization, because I advertised this talk about climate change, so I think a lot of people are here for climate change. Uh, can, I, can I ask you, what is the, the biggest challenge with regards to incorporating climate uncertainty in the, kind, in the kinds of stochastic optimization models that you've been describing? In, in your experience, what's the biggest challenge? about climate change. You mentioned one thing, that it's hard to predict what uh, the climate is going to do based on past data. Is there anything else that uh, is a unique challenge that comes from climate uncertainty? Well, first, it's a type of uncertainty we've never seen before. Uh, usually, you have, I mean, if you look at the theories, I, I'm not an expert, but I've talked to people. Uh, the number of theories about climate, uh, climate change and how wide it can be is huge. I mean, it's, let's say I talk to people in the copper industry. Okay, the price can go three dollars, five dollars, it's manageable. But it can go from some people say it's relatively moderate to the whole world will be destroyed. The, 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 the level of uncertainty is not. I, I, I don't see it in other things. It's a huge. Uh, it, it's a huge challenge, but that's for the climate people. 
Now, going one, one level more uh, of specialization, how will it affect my life? I'm a forester, I'm a miner, I'm an energy. Uh, how is it going to affect us? It's not well known. Again, because it's so new. And then, is what are the major problems? Am I really, really concerned about tree growth? So I'll get a bit more or less money. I'm concerned about forest fires. Climate change is making a huge difference in forest fires. Not so much. I, it, it may influence tree growth, maybe 10% more, 10%. But it's not major. It's not going to change our lives. What's going on with uh, forest fires, uh, again, an anecdote. Since I'm in the football club uh, six, seven years ago, the press calls me every day. Are you going to fire the coach or not? Uh, are you going to hire this? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've done really nice things in operations research, but the press didn't really didn't care. Oh, so you have these very nice logistic things about using containers. Who cares? But are you going to fire the coach that's major news? The only thing that goes well below, but still, no, they have been calling me about forest fires. The press is concerned about forest fires. It concern, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's happening here. In California, it's big. In Australia, it's big. It's, it's, look, they, Amazon is different. They don't call me. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe they call some of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in forest fires here? Brian. Yeah. They call you? They call. They are, everybody's worried about it. And just, I'll talk at the end. I'll give you two minutes, OK, what we're doing in forest fires, which is the major thing we're doing now. So just, this is very technical. Uh, there are several ways of doing multi-attribute, low programming, AHP, something. What we did here is we know a Pareto coefficient for years. Here we have erosion. Here was MPV, right? And for this different carbon, uh, car carbon uh, sequestration. And basically what we ended up is and there the decision maker has to know where he wants to be. Here is erosion, here is money, expected the value, and for different values of the carbon sequestration. That's one way of knowing about it. Nobody really cares in the real world, nobody pays attention to this, it's, but we've got a nice paper in the journal. <laughs> Please write. One small thing about risk aversion. Uh, basically, uh, what they've been doing is neutral risk aversion. No. Now, suppose that uh, most people are risk averse, most, and it makes sense. Uh, if you're in a company and make a decision in which you gain a lot of money, you gain maybe a small promotion. If you make a bad decision, <coughs> Uh, I don't know if you, if you know about inventory. Most companies are overstocked in inventory. Because if a customer wants something and it's not there, everybody will know. If you overstock, nobody really, it's like a submerged cost. It's there, I mean, you're paying capital and holding costs, but it's not visible. So every project we've done, we start from the basics, they're overstocked. Major problem is from for a transportation company, uh, one of the top ten companies in the world, half a million containers. They, they, we save them eighty million dollars a year, and the basic saving was we could reduce the stocks of containers we have with the same quality. <coughs> uh, so risk averse is there, and one way is what they call risk is the highest value of uh, such that they. The weight of the scenarios, which will give you an amount of money below alpha, is more greater than the beta. For example, I don't want to lose money, I have scenarios, so I want that the number of scenarios where I'm losing money will be small. That's a basic example, for example, 5%. And this is the result. This is the neutral person. You can see how spread out the results are. Whereas the condition, the value of risk, 
here, you see that the potential rate of this, we are also worried that even those that were losing money and don't lose too much, you see a much more concentrated. Now, this is very big shift there. The average here is better, but the, the variation is much higher. So basically, if you're risk averse, you pay in premium, in which the expected value is worse, but the worst case scenarios are not so bad. Okay, as a conclusion, as it exists, it's important, it should be considered explicitly in some way. Most managers are obviously aware of certainty. What they usually do is add what we call fat. Instead of having 10 people, I'll put 11 people, just in case. But I'm not going to do, let's say, the productivity may be uncertain, I make sure I'm going to satisfy the, 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 the goal by putting more machines or more people in it. It's, it's a complex problem, and it's not clear how much effort the companies are willing to put. In mining, they're doing it, because there's too much money involved. In forestry, I haven't seen it. And the same about the criteria. I want to end with a little bit of forest fires, which is something we've been working on the last three years or so. Uh, Sandra has been involved with it in the last time. We started working with Canada, uh, Dave Martel, who's a big guy in forest fires. Uh, there, what already exists and works well is fire simulation models. Once the fire starts, uh, you can predict pretty well, given topography, vegetation, winds, etc., how the fire will spread, which is very useful to know how to, uh, where you send your teams and your helicopters, where to put the fire breaks. What we're trying to work on is what they call fuel management or, or landscape design is how should you manage the forest now before the fires so that whenever a fire starts the damage won't be so bad. It's a highly, uh, it's a highly co uh, is a certain problem. Where's, where's the fire going to start? In Canada it's more, most likely lightning. In Chile or Catalonia it's mostly man-made fires. So it's, where was it going to ignite? How fast is it going to, to spread? In which direction? This uncertainty. So what, what we built uh, are simulation models, unlike the ones that exist, that interact very well with optimization of decision making. That, that's the work we did. And we, we, we're working quite a bit now in Catalonia, where we're starting to implement it. And we'll, hope to work with people here in Washington, people in California. We have a whole network of people working on this. And uh, for those of you who are in forest fires, we can chat a bit about it. We, we think that it's, something, it's a tool that is needed because decisions need to be made on how to manage a forest now, now not, not just when the fire starts. Okay, thank you for your attention and in here. Questions for Professor Weintraub? No? I have one. Yeah, go ahead. So, you talked about the risk averse. Risk averse uh, in the decision making. How can you integrate the risk averse in the climate change model or in forest planning with climate change? Basically, you take climate change, eventually it will lead to that stochastic model. Eventually. Then you have to, it, it hasn't been done, it's, it's a good question. You have to see, okay, what am I averse to? And how does it affect my risk? Because my basic uncertainty started with the climate change. So then you can say, okay, if this climate change happens, it's just going to kill me. I'm risk averse. So I go down that line and say, oh, these are the measures I have to take to contain this, this scenario of climate, which is complicated. Because what you're looking at your model is, is, is already something that's been developed from the climate change, but it's not really the regular climate change. So uh, there's
uh, do companies or do small firms have the maturity of these more complex models? Or are we going to give them the answers and they apply it? The, uh, managers I find, are very pragmatic. They are still thinking, they are pragmatic. If, if you can show me that what you have will help me, uh, I, I'm going to work with, with it. Second, I, I want to work with you. One of the things that we found out, first, uh, usually the manager you work with is a bit scared that, oh, he's coming to install a system, it's going to take away my job. So you have to convince no, it's not that way. It's, you're going to be part of it, and you're going to use it, and it'll give you much better answers, and you have much more time to think about strategies, study. The second is you have to work with that person all the time. It's not that you give me the problem, I go back to my lab and come back since my later. The problem keeps changing. It always happens. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. Or, uh, the problem we end up with is never the one we start. I see many people saying, yes, it's happened to you too. Uh, so you have to keep it, uh, keep working. So, uh, so once you're partnering, they want to understand what you're doing. Now, the humanistic models, you can sort of explain. Stochastic models are more difficult. So it starts by the fact, I don't really understand what you're doing here with these scenarios, the pH, et cetera. That already works the answer. And then they don't want to spend too much time. They, they don't have time. Uh, if you work, everybody has worked with managers, I mean, getting a few hours of your time, is, I mean, they have all these fires in, in the company. So uh, it's going to be complex, and I have to be honest. I personally am not even sure that these sophisticated methods will really work. There's so much uncertainty in the scenarios and all the stuff we're doing. It's going to take time. In some cases, like uh, cover prices, it's, it's they're doing they're using. For example, this small example. Uh, a colleague of mine, Roger West, and a student, to work on future prices of, of copper. Now, the history, using statistics, uh, differential equations, etc., is good enough for maybe six months, unless something happens. Now, to predict the future, year from now, the best thing they could do is take the, go to the Wall Street, the uh, uh, market. What are the future prices of copper to year from now? That's the best information we have. It's very difficult. I mean, is it good enough? No. Uh, so, it's in some cases the stochastic models are fairly good. In some cases, uh, like climate change, we know we have to consider it. But I, I, I mean, our models are still very, very approximate. We're going to use in forest fires uh, climate change. How does it change? Okay, we use the we use ROS, the spread of fire. Okay, from this point to this point today, it's this because of vegetation. Now tomorrow the weather changes; it's going to be dry, winter. It's going to change. How much is going to change? I mean, it's speculation. We know that, and we're going to test in our models different scenarios. But uh, we know a lot less of, of that, and we know of power prices to be. Uh, can it be something like a, an online update that you, you, you can do from your home and connect it to the company? To, to develop the model or? No, no, but you have the model and you include this, this you have to do it. So you include a, the update in the model itself and every time or every short period you, okay. you update it. With yeah, sure. Uh, within the system, so, so so in the model itself, there's an update factor. You should have that consistent with how often decisions are made. Mm -hmm. If decisions are made once a week, you don't need to update more than once a week. For example, one one project we have, which is tremendously ambitious, okay, we're doing it with people in UC Berkeley, is have a world map divided into sub-regions, maybe 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers, with a risk of fire tomorrow. So red, deep red, watch out. It's probably going to be a big fire tomorrow, so with colors. We just started with that. 
they're, they're getting all the data from NASA and other sources. And if that gets going, it would be a, a bit, if it works, uh, to have a map, let's say, of all North America, in which we have each sub-region, uh, the, the risk of fire for the next few days would be a, a, a big value added. Today they have it, but in huge chunks, I mean, like the whole countries. Any other questions? I have a general, general question about Chilean forestry. Why is it so difficult to compete against timber from Chile for all those countries that produce timber from natural forests? Like Central America, Mexico, Brazil, they have to harvest natural forests and Chile brings in timber to all those countries way cheaper than next, like 100 kilometers from I, pine, it's pine plantations, but actually Monterey pine plantations. Uh, they grow fast in Chilean soils. Uh, the management is good. And Shander mentioned the roads. So the Chile planted the agricultural are, fields. Hmm? Chile planted the agricultural, many agricultural fields. So that's, that makes a big difference. Uh, and, well, and there's discussion. The foresters, companies say, no, this is land that <laughs> wouldn't be used for anything else. Also, distances are short. That helps. Uh, I mean, we're near the coast for export. Also, the management is good. Uh, Chile exports management in the sense that they have investments in Argentina, Uruguay, and other. So, and, and you can, I, uh, just what we did in day-to-day -day harvesting, uh, we saved about 10% of costs, of operating costs. So management makes a difference. Uh, the land is probably good. Uh, yeah, take take credit, Andres. I mean, you can take credit for, for some of this. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And, and isn't this a good example of why we want to make these plantations uh, to be more productive and operationally efficient? So maybe they relieve pressure on natural forests. Uh, Portugal sure planted trees, and they are not efficient. Where? Portugal. Ah. They're not eucalyptus or radiator? They don't have the industry. What's the radiata? It's radiata, eucalyptus. More biotic resistance. Our companies are doing well, that I know. Uh, but I, I also, I mean, what you have here in the north, northwest, it's a completely different type of trees. The native forests, I mean, they are much more valuable per cubic meter than the uh, pine is not really noble, noble, noble wood. It's, it's, it's used for very basic stuff. But uh, maybe Yoshi can say something because you asked about the private companies or small companies using some of these malls. Uh, so uh, he's here from Bridgestone Corporation for the, for the exact reason that uh, they face two, two uncertain um, factors. One is disease, right, for rubber plantations. And the other one is wind, wind damage. So how can we help those plantations um, and, and increase their efficiency in the face of uncertainty driven by uh, some harmful pathogens as well as wind? So, um, so it can make a difference. There is an interest. And um, well, hopefully we, uh, we can contribute to uh, have you know, better, to better models. And, Maybe uh, two years from now, when you leave, we, we can be a little bit more optimistic than, than Andres is, uh, has been here about the future of these stochastic models. I don't know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in general, if you look at industry, uh, I'm editor of, or in the Journal of Operations Research, the practice. I see very few articles. In order to publish it, you have to have some, somebody using it. Very few examples of companies really using stochastic programming in, in their basic decision making. Very few. They wouldn't disclose it. I wouldn't be surprised if Maybe. some of them are using it, but they won't, won't disclose not, it. Not finance, for example. Finance is all uncertain. They, they, they are very sophisticated. But in production, it's, it's less. Any more questions? Um, you can ask about soccer. 
This guy, can, he can cite the, the names of the players uh, from the Hungary German, I'm Hungarian, the Hungary Germany uh, uh, World Cup final 1954. He can cite the names of all the players. You, 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 you name a big game, he knows the names of the players. And it's the one of the top teams in the history of the soccer. <laughs> Not anymore, but. Uh,